Chapter 30, Technology, Hard and Soft If such drivers have no faster alternative route, those are the people who I would encourage to change jobs or change houses. The city of Edina needs to build some arterials. MnDOT Ramp Meter Chief Engineer, November 28, 1999, Minneapolis Star Tribune. 30.1 Metering Motoring We define technology as a way of doing things. A technology may be hard and embodied in physical tools, or soft and embodied in protocols. Usually these are linked. Highways, for example, have a technology for traffic control that is embodied in signal systems and so on, and also a set of rules for drivers. At a much broader scale, one may think of the physical makeup of a mode as a technology, with a companion set of soft technologies embodied in institutions, regulations, standards, and so on. Here is an example that introduces current technology development efforts. Ramp meters, traffic signals posted on freeway entrance ramps, seek to regulate the flow of traffic entering the freeway. They serve two main purposes. First, they limit the number of vehicles trying to merge simultaneously, smoothing traffic flow, and reducing crashes. Second, they keep the total number of vehicles in the freeway trying to simultaneously use a critical bottleneck just below a threshold, capacity, so that the freeway flow doesn't exceed capacity, and thereby avoiding queuing. In and of themselves, those are both reasonable goals for managing a mature system, and most travelers readily accept traffic lights in other contexts. Yet somehow in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, ramp meters became the transportation issue of 2000. The reasons are clear in retrospect, but may not have been in advance. As can be seen in the figure, ramp meters were slowly deployed in the 1970s and 1980s, and became much more widespread in the 1990s. As road capacity was built out, additional roads became more and more difficult to build, not only in monetary cost, but also in political will. The leadership of the Minnesota Department of Transportation, MnDOT, viewed ramp meters as a way of stretching the system slightly further, eking out a small capacity improvement and a significant speed improvement at a cost much below that of adding lanes to the freeway. Yet the Twin Cities continued to grow, as did peak hour travel demand. The primary effect of ramp meters is to move delay from the freeway to the entrance ramp. By the late 1990s, some commuters experienced long delays at some ramps, in cases upward of 20 minutes. In 1999, Dick Day, a senator from Owatonna, Minnesota, a rural community outside the metered metropolitan area, pushed a Freedom to Drive package. This package called for shutting off all of the ramp meters, allowing all cars to use HOV lanes, and establishing the left lane as a passing-only lane. Day claims to drive 70,000 miles a year, which averages to over three hours a day in his car. The reader can assess whether this is reasonable or hyperbole. Day was able to obtain press for his initiative, and in November 1999, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the state's largest newspaper, printed a large Sunday front-page piece on ramp meters. The opening quote of the chapter is from that article. Discussions with the engineers reveal several things. First, they were certain metering was the right thing, and they believed that shutting off the meters would be catastrophic. Second, they were indifferent to the fact that some drivers had long commutes so that others would have shorter commutes. They did not see ramp delay as an important metric. Rather, if the freeway flows were higher than without the meters, and at higher speeds, they knew they were reducing total delay. If more total travel is using the freeway, then there is less total travel on alternative slower routes. Third, they were highly resistant to outside analysis probably because of distrust of the outcome would be different from their own. Nevertheless, to avoid the threatened shutdown, MnDOT commissioned three separate University of Minnesota studies to evaluate meters. One might suggest that these studies were a holding strategy, essentially telling the state legislature, see, we are studying this, please go away. However, those studies did not involve shutting down the ramp meter operations. Rather, they would conduct computer simulations to examine operations with and without meters, compare metering approaches from a number of cities, and examine empirical data. Despite these studies, in May 2002, the Minnesota State Legislature insisted on a shutdown experiment, which would last at least four weeks. A large consulting firm was hired to conduct the study. Many of MnDOT's ramp meter engineers were excluded from the study process, their biases and lack of political acumen having been demonstrated, as were the university researchers, who were funded by MnDOT and therefore tainted by association. Traffic data were collected before the shutoff period, and then the meters were to be shut off for a period of at least four weeks to conduct the study in October 2000. Because of weather, the study was extended a few more weeks. Due to the lack of catastrophe, the study was extended a few more, since it was clear that MnDOT could not return to the old metering strategy, and no new strategy was obvious. Eventually, the meters were turned on, December 2000, but running at their fastest rate so the queues would not get too long. Over time, a new strategy was developed to cap maximum weights at the ramps at four minutes. 
Dick Day was not entirely satisfied, and Mindot's staff was unhappy with the shift in their worldview, but the residents of the Twin Cities seem happier with the system than before. Meters are but one of many new technologies collectively dubbed Intelligent Transportation Systems, ITS. The new technologies vary from simple operational improvements, for example, ramp meters, freeway service patrols, tow trucks that quickly service disabled vehicles, to more sophisticated information systems, in-vehicle navigation systems that tell drivers the shortest path given real-time congestion information, or bus stops that tell you to the minute when the next bus will arrive, to control systems, adaptive cruise control that will follow the speed of the vehicle ahead, automated highway systems that will control all movement of vehicles. While some of these technologies have already been deployed, many have not and, met and won't be for another decade, if ever. Yet, already controversies emerge. This chapter will treat the origins and status of ITS technology development and implementation efforts. It will remark on the roles of standards. ITS is receiving attention, and it provides a technology example for considerations of innovation and the generation of imaginative actions. Before talking about ITS, the question might be asked, do we see Twin City stories as we visit the modes and efforts for their improvement? Well, in a way, as one answer, recalling the within-mode structure of systems, there are activities and equipment, facilities, and operation sectors. Recalling behaviors over the life cycle, marginal improvements to entrenched ways of doing things is the rule at mature stages in the life cycle. Recalling that advances are made by importing new tools, it is not surprising that information and communications technologies are being introduced into transportation efforts. But there is more on the technology shelf. There are improvements in physical and human resource management, materials, lubrication, and endless other things. So we see fly-by-wire aircraft, automated monitoring and control of ships, widespread monitoring and control in the logistics aspects of freight movements, monitoring and control of freight, trains, and locomotives, application of smart cards to enable electronic toll collection and fare payments on transit, and many other activities. Improvements rather than replacement is the rule, and technology delays the onset of diminishing returns. Well, no is another answer. That's partly because markets are better defined in some non-ITS situations, and there are competitive pressures in some other situations. Firms operating ships and aircraft, managers of competitive ports, trucking firms investing in location finding and communication devices. The champions of technology improvement command the payoffs, the rents. That's not the case with some ITS technologies and services. 30.2 Magic Motorways The dream of what we now call intelligent transportation systems first gained widespread attention at the 1939 New York World's Fair. In particular, General Motors' Highways and Horizons exhibit, better known as Futurama, pictured the world of a large metropolis in 1960, containing completely grade-separated freeways running some type of automated highway system. As part of the 1939 World Fair and Futurama display, GM commissioned a film, To New Horizons, which is a peon to progress. It emphasized new places to go and new means of getting there. This Norman Bel Geddes vision of the future may have been too soon, Obviously, 1960 came and went, and the interstates were barely under construction, much less an automated highway system. Yet the vision remains. He documented this in his book, Magic Motorways. Bel Geddes started as a set designer on Broadway and migrated to industrial design. He is also known for his advocacy of Art Deco streamlining, as described in Horizons. Fittingly, his daughter, Barbara Bel Geddes, was an actress best known for playing matriarch Miss Ellie on the popular primetime oil industry soap opera, Dallas. In Magic Motorways, Norman Bel Geddes made a great number of suggestions to improve the efficiency of then-existing auto truck highway systems. The modern road builder should be concerned with safety, comfort, speed, and economy. The existing system, he noted, emerged from cow paths and the like, the result of subsequent incremental improvements, but no systematic design. If all roads were designed like the best roads, the death toll would be reduced by 80%. Even the best road of the day, the Long Island Motor Parkway, had curves that were too sharp, hills that were too steep and was too narrow. He complained about truck way stations at every state line as an infringement of interstate commerce. He further complained about speed traps, noting that in Connecticut, for example, traffic constables were rewarded proportionate to the revenue they brought in from speeders, which was unfair to tourists. In Toledo, he reports, red lights were turned off at night because motorists were being held up when they stopped. Belgetti's endorsed one-way street conversion noting that volume and speeds both increased by 20% in Philadelphia when Chestnut, Walnut, and Market Streets were converted. He argued that motorways should connect cities, but not enter the actual concentration points. He suggests that perhaps there were too many private cars in congested areas of cities. Cars that did not have business on a street should not be on the street. This kind of pattern is only achievable with a highly hierarchic street network. 
He wanted road building and management to be under the auspices of higher levels of government to improve quality and network consistencies. When road building depends on local and personal whims, a four-lane highway is likely to be sent swooping through a mess of haberdasheries and then without explanation to peter out at the town or county line into a narrow McAdam road. He reported a plan of architect Ernest Flagg that grade-separated pedestrians, fast vehicles, and slow vehicles. Technology, too, could be a factor. To identify one example that has yet to be resolved some 70 years later, why must drivers dim their brights manually when facing an oncoming car? Surely this could be automated. There were several implicit objectives of this vision, illustrated in figures 30.2, 30.3, and 30.4. One was to promote cars and highways as the vision of the future. Clearly that much came to pass. While there are buses in the Futurama exhibit, trains and streetcars were downplayed. Another removes the driver from control of the vehicle. This was seen as advantageous because drivers are the cause of most crashes. Further, machines respond faster than humans, and so can follow more closely at higher speed while still remaining safe. A third was the separation of pedestrians from vehicles. The elevated sidewalks, or skyways, are an idea borrowed from other visions of the future and have both safety and efficiency aspects, though urban designers often see separation as problematic. Notably, Bureau of Public Roads Chief Thomas McDonald thought Bel Geddes a crackpot. The last thing the country needed was 14-lane bands of concrete crisscrossing the hinterlands. Thirty point three automated highways the clash between technology and deployment in august nineteen ninety seven at demo ninety seven in San Diego, California, researchers of automated highway systems AHS demonstrate a system on the reversible high occupancy vehicle HOV express lanes of i fifteen as shown in the figure, especially equipped cars were able to follow at high speeds without driver intervention at a fixed 6.4 meter, 20 foot, following distance using advanced communications technologies and some low-tech in-road magnets to help with lane guidance. While the demonstration was a technical success, funding for research in this area was promptly cut, and the National Automated Highway System Consortium, which sponsored the demonstrations, was disbanded. This is not to suggest it was a waste. Much was learned. First, the possibilities of deployment of such systems, which relies on intelligent highways and inter-vehicle communication, are much more difficult than deployment of autonomous intelligent vehicles, sometimes referred to as self-driving vehicles, SDVs. While SDVs are harder to engineer, they can operate in mixed traffic without upgrading both the infrastructure and all other vehicles. AHS suffered from a chicken and egg problem par excellence. Who would buy an expensive AHS vehicle with no routes? And who would build a new network of AHS lanes with no vehicles? Where the intelligence in a network technology lies is a critical question that needs to be answered. We've seen various mixes throughout the history of transportation, from smart vehicles, cars and their drivers, we hope, and dumb links, a simple roadway, to dumb vehicles, trains that don't have steering, and smart links, the tracks steer the train at junctions. However, it is clear that compatibility with existing systems is a crucial question. While you can drive a car over railroad tracks and get somewhere, though it may be a bumpy ride, it would be difficult to take a train and drive on streets. It would keep going straight until it hit something. Second, much knowledge was gained about the specific technologies, which ones work, which don't, and which can be adapted to other technology paths. For example, intelligent vehicles. Most participants in intelligent transportation systems work would probably agree with these conclusions. The interpretations we will make now require modest to major stretches. Even so, we make them because we think they may lie behind the faltering of the ITS national program and applications such as the Twin Cities ramp metering. It is a modest stretch to speculate that the inherently disjoint nature of the structures of the auto highway system and truck highway systems is a major shaper of technology improvement. In a conversation with some auto manufacturers, we found that they have a policy of internalizing all improvements in a vehicle. We cannot expect the highway people to do anything. We were discussing vehicle guidance systems. The company will use expensive inertial devices to track location rather than off-board fixed facilities. GPS has significantly helped in this regard, but this infrastructure was provided by the military, not for civilian transportation, and was only reluctantly opened up. We find especially in the highway sector that because vehicles, vehicle trips, and highways are produced separately, unlike in railroads where a single organization specifies vehicles, operates them, and controls the track, Highly disjoint behavior restricts development options. This diminished expectation of infrastructure, and especially integration, 
and is the reason heard most often for compartmentalizing development efforts to drivers, navigation systems, automobiles, intelligent cruise control and vehicle braking, and highways, traffic flow sensors, and ramp metering. It is a bit more of a stretch to ask, why can't one count on others? The mismatch of institutional norms, which may create adversarial relations, and controls, political or market, might be a partial answer, and lack of motive for joint efforts another. Glory, status, and feel-good rewards motivate only so much. The motive that counts is making the profits or capturing the rents, saving time, or what have you. What is mine is mine is at work. This point about who captures the rents has already been made, but it bears underlining in an institutional context. Stretching some more, there is a clash of cultures. To illustrate, ramp metering aims to make best use of agency resources and minimize total delay. Perhaps drivers see this as inequitable because some are stuck in traffic while others whiz by. Is the agency limiting my use of common property the road? Some see it one way, others another. 30.4. Intelligent Vehicles. The Rise of the Robots. Automation in the automobile sector resulted in horses being replaced by engines. On the production side, labor is already being replaced by machinery and robots. The hours of labor per car are steadily declining over time. Brynjolfsson and McAfee, 2011, relay a possibly apocryphal story. Ford CEO Henry Ford II and United Automobile Workers President Walter Reuther are jointly touring a modern auto plant. Ford jokingly jabs at Reuther, Walter, how are you going to get these robots to pay UAW dues? Not missing a beat, Reuther responds, Henry, how are you going to get them to buy your cars? We may eventually see drivers replaced with robots. In late 2010, Google announced that it had been secretly testing autonomous vehicles in traffic. After hiring members of the successful teams from the 2007 DARPA Urban Challenge, including Sebastian Thrun, they developed a small fleet of autonomous vehicles which they drove for 100,000 miles, 160,000 kilometers, in traffic in the San Francisco Bay Area. As of 2012, the number is over 500,000 miles, or 800,000 kilometers. While the car still had drivers ready to take the wheel, the tests were successful. The cars themselves caused no crashes while in autonomous mode. One was rear-ended, and later the car got into a fender bender when a human driver was in control. Why Robot Cars Matter First, safety. Cars would be safe if only there weren't drivers behind the wheel. Driverless cars seldom get distracted or tired, have really fast perception reaction times, know exactly how hard to brake, and can communicate, potentially, with vehicles around them with mobile ad hoc networks. But this improves not only vehicle safety, it improves the safety and environment for pedestrians and bicyclists. Capacity. Robot cars can follow other driverless cars at significantly reduced distance and can stay within much narrower lanes with greater accuracy. Capacity at bottlenecks should improve, both in throughput per lane and the number of lanes per unit road width. These cars still need to go somewhere, so we need capacity on city streets as well as freeways. But we save space on parking, see section 15.5, and lane width everywhere. If we can reduce lane width and have adequate capacity, we can reduce paved area and still see higher throughput. Most road space is not used most of the time. Vehicle diversity. Narrow and specialized cars are now more feasible with computers driving increased overall safety. Especially if we move to cloud commuting, as below, we can have greater variety and more precision in the fleet with the right size car for the job. Fourth, travel behavior. If the cost of traveling per trip declines, drivers need to exert less effort and lose less effective time since they can do something else, we would expect more trips, my taxi can take me wherever, and longer trips and more trips by robocar. Fifth, land use. If acceptable trip distances increase, we would expect a greater spread of origins and destinations, pejoratively sprawl, just as commuter trains enable exurban living or living in a different city. Sixth, parking. My car can drop me off at the front door and go fairly remotely to park, so we don't need to devote valuable space to surface parking or parking ramps, garages. We still need space, it is just far away. Searching for parking is also less critical. On-street parking can be abolished. Seventh, for the transportation disadvantaged, children, the physically challenged, and others who cannot or should not drive, they are now enabled. Parents, friends, and siblings need not shuttle children around. The vehicle can do that by itself. The differences between transit and private vehicles begin to collapse. We can seriously consider giving passes to driverless taxis for the poor, since costs should drop with lower labor costs and if the point below holds, paratransit services become much less expensive. Eighth, reduced auto ownership. Cloud commuting becomes possible. People no longer need to own a car. They can instead subscribe to a car sharing service. 
Cloud computing is the idea that cars would be provided from a giant pool operated by remote organizations in the cloud. The organization would dispatch a vehicle that drives to the customer on demand and in short order, which then delivers the customer to the destination. The vehicle would have each customer's preferences preloaded, seat position, computing ability, audio environment. The customer benefits by not tying up capital in vehicles nor having to worry about maintaining or fueling vehicles. The fleet is used more efficiently. Each vehicle would annually travel two or three times more than current vehicles, so the fleet would turn over faster and be more modern. Fewer vehicles overall would be needed. It is likely customers would need to pay for this service, either as a subscription or per-use basis. One imagines that stores might subsidize transportation, as might employers, as benefits for the customers or staff, just as they subsidize parking now. We have car sharing services which require large networks of members to be valuable, so the member can be near a vehicle and there will be vehicles available. In the United States, there are several companies, including the once stock exchange listed, though not profitable, Zipcar, providing these services. With greater value, such a service should have more members and thus more vehicle choice and shorter wait times. In short, there is a potential magic bullet to be had. See Chapter 10. The story above is a story of a future, one where we can look back at how technology changed transportation. Robot cars will, of course, allow us to do the same thing, driving to and from, better, replacing the easily distractible attention of the driver with the perfect attention of a computer. In that respect, it polishes the existing system. But robots are also a new beginnings, a transformation that will allow us to do new things. No longer will only licensed drivers have automobility. Children and the disabled can access cars as needed. No longer will families need to own a fleet of vehicles. Each can call the right-sized vehicle on demand. No longer will drivers lose an hour or two per day traveling, while travel will not be timeless until the transporter from Star Trek is invented. Travel will be much more productive as other things can be done. No longer will cities be swamped with parking lots as robot cars can go away and park themselves where land is abundant. No longer will people need to maintain cars. That cost can be centralized. If the cost of travel is lower, we would expect more of it. This change will not be necessarily welcomed, but it is a logical progression and presents one possible future. At the time of this writing, the technology is not quite ready. Finding the right formula for mix of vehicles, location of vehicles, amount of time people will wait when summoning vehicle before arrival, and so on, will be important experiments in this area. Google is petitioning states to change their laws to permit on-road driverless vehicle testing. California, Nevada, and Florida have so far gone along. 30.5 Planning Technology The issue isn't whether technology is incorporated in planning processes, but rather how it is incorporated. The Urban Transportation Planning Process, see Chapter 24, which was developed for a growing mode, highways, and is now applied to mature ones, highways and transit, doesn't explicitly recognize technology. Rather, it takes technology as a given and fails to consider change in technology. At best, some clutches to test new technology are incorporated as network elements and demand shifts, but often computed with post-processors. Fortunately, the urban transportation planning process is not the only one. Other planning efforts consider technology in different ways as the life cycle progresses. As the predominant technology emerges, hard and soft technologies receive much attention. They are used as building blocks for system designs. Here, the issue is how widely innovators scope for building blocks and the decisions made as designs are frozen by standards. During this period, the process is not ergodic. Each decision made by historical accident will not be smoothed out by future actions. A history-dependent path is created. Technology is also an agent for planning as a system grows to maturity. Hard and soft technological standards constrain the planning process. They also serve as objectives, for planning seeks to put those technologies in place in some desirable way. At maturity, one issue is operations. Other issues have to do with productivity declines, market channeling, repair, and maintenance. Mensch, 1979, uses the word pseudo-innovations for related technology efforts. That word recognizes that there is not much to be accomplished by tweaking a mature system. Similarly, Tyler Cowen identifies a great stagnation at play. Our view is negative, but not as negative as Mensch. For one thing, we begin to see some cross-component work, such as ITS. There is also a willingness to bring in some outside-the-system technologies such as those being incorporated in railroad control systems. Because of the division of labor between design and policy, planners often assume that technology considerations are being managed elsewhere. There are good reasons for division of labor. The large number of people involved in technology fields in the large literature suggests that technology is being taken care of elsewhere. We can understand the planner's assumption. However, the reader of this text will recognize that it is, of course, an unacceptable assumption for transportation.
30.6 Standards and Orthostandards There are two related meanings for the word standard that are of interest to transportation professionals. The first has to do with compatibility. The idea traces from interchangeable parts. We want a standard to ensure that part A from one manufacturer can fit with part B from a second manufacturer. It is contrasted with custom. The second has to do with quality or performance. For example, achieving a level of service standard, which we will call ortho standards, meaning correct standard, to avoid confusion. We may want to ensure that we meet the ortho standard that the road operates at level of service C or better, and we'll use that ortho standard to decide how many lanes the road should have. Both types of standards serve to ensure consistent design, though one can be thought of as hard and the other soft. Each will translate into the other. Standards are established as systems grow. Often they are simply ratifying whatever decision the first innovator made. An example is George Stevenson's use of what became standard rail gauge, which remains after nearly two centuries. The use of classification and standards follows the rationalist scientific paradigm of the 19th and 20th centuries. However, the extension and ubiquity of normative ortho standards, beyond what is necessary for inter-system compatibility, is more difficult to understand. Here are some thoughts. 1. One has to have ortho standards in order to classify, so ortho standards resulted from the urge to classify. 2. Experts have superior knowledge and can prescribe what is best. 3. While it is true that ortho standards do not fit every case exactly, they fit fairly well and offer great efficiencies in processes of planning and management. Fourth, standards and ortho standards support articulation goals. In the case of roads, standardized driving environments, for example, signs are essential. Five, without ortho standards, people would cheat. For example, authority high in the hierarchy can control dishonesty at lower levels in the hierarchy. Sixth, ortho standards support the common carrier, common law, public utility ethic of similar service to citizens in similar circumstances. Seventh, Consumer protection requires standards and ortho standards, for example, for safety. A. Standards and ortho standards reduce construction costs. Conversations with the USDOT staff mainly involve 2, 5, 7, or 8, depending on the subject, but it is difficult to get conversations going. Most engineers and planners seem to take ortho standards as a matter of course, caring about how and never worrying why. Transportation professionals are very committee-oriented, and there exist a number of committees to establish all sorts of transportation standards and ortho standards, from uniformity in traffic control devices to what factors to include when determining the value of highway assets. Most of these committees deal with known problems and are simply ratifying existing procedures and regularizing them, or choosing among competing alternatives. However, there is one notable example of trying to put the cart before the horse, so to speak. The transportation community has spent hundreds of thousands of hours and several forests worth of trees to document the national ITS architecture, defined by its advocates as a common framework for planning, defining, and integrating intelligent transportation systems. They note that it is a mature product that reflects the contributions of a broad cross-section of the ITS community, transportation practitioners, systems engineers, system developers, technology specialists, consultants, etc. However, there is very little to show for this effort. The few ITS applications in place developed organically, like the Twin Cities ramp metering system, local freeway service patrols, automakers' in-vehicle navigation systems like OnStar, or Google's self-driving vehicle, rather than as a result of this process. The most successful ITS applications, electronic toll collection, has produced transponders that are incompatible between regions, largely because, one, they made decisions and grew independently, two, they felt no reason to pay more than lip service to the architecture, and three, the cost of coordination outweighed the benefits of compatibility. However, over time, one expects that compatible transponders will be developed, so that one can use the same device to pay tolls in Maine and California. Either one of the technologies will be selected and phased into the other region, or the groups will get together to standardize on a next-generation technology that is better and deploy that over time. ETC transponders and smart cards are likely to face a convergent path, as the wireless transmission of money has applications far beyond paying tolls. Stepping back, we discussed ITS at the beginning of the chapter. ITS was funded for several reasons, improving transportation probably being secondary to helping large defense firms convert to civilian sectors as the Cold War ended. It is no surprise that the defense industry applied their top-down, systems engineering approach that was successful in the weapons-making business to the more target-oriented transportation sector. An alternative approach would have allowed the technologies to emerge bottom-up 
and then work toward compatibility and standardization among successful systems. This organic approach is more in keeping with the history of successful technologies in both transportation. There was no national railroad architecture, at least not until the era of rationalization, and then it was largely ignored, as well as communications, where the internet developed without a master plan, but rather a series of decisions, politely called requests for comments, were made when they were needed. 30.7. Standards as Economic Decisions Economic analysis is applied in highly constrained circumstances. The existence of agreed-upon standards constrain the analysis context. Given the standards, what does analysis say? Consider the interstate. Decisions were made about the product. There were a lot of layers to those decisions. They started with the free, limited-access design decision, then laid out the general location of freeway links, involved the formulas for the distribution of funding among the states, and finally focused on the level of service to be provided. There was much economic content in each decision, but the decisions were regarded as standards somehow detached from economic decisions. The level of service decision was important. A level of service class C was to be provided on urban freeways, B on rural, and that was targeted on the 30th highest traffic hour for the design year. Although set as a design ortho standard by AASHTO, that was very much an economic decision. There were equity economic decisions mixed in. All cities got the same service level, the value of time was set low, and the value of time was the same for all members of the population. From discussions with ASHO leaders, the decisions were driven by the question, how far will the available money stretch? Urban facilities are expensive to construct relative to rural ones, and that's the reason for the rural-urban difference. The idea we wish to transmit is this. Ortho standard setting substitutes for economic analysis. There remains room for economic decisions within the context of the standards that had been set. These residual decisions were important, but small compared to the big standard setting decisions. We find this a truism in many sectors, in addition to highways in the public sector generally. 30.8 Discussion Professionals often believe, and are affirmed by management consultants, that they are engaging in strategic planning when they are doing nothing of the sort. They are merely producing pseudo-innovations. Recommendations to undertake more radical technology planning fall on deaf ears, Change threatens. Beyond the ways technology has been incorporated in planning, we suggest two additional strategies. One is to begin to incorporate system-changing technologies in the building block birthing style as systems age. The objective would be renewal, one system rising from the ashes of another. A strong argument can be made for this strategy. We strive to create competing technologies once most of the goodies have been extracted from the old mode. More important, we know how to do this because the historical record is clear. We just emulate the past. A more desirable strategy would be to smoothly create new options. This requires forging an inquiring style of planning that continually considers and envisions new futures and creates paths towards those futures. Society can then control its future by choosing among alternatives. This dynamic planning would create new hooks for the future. An object-oriented approach, to borrow some jargon from computer science, would allow one layer to be removed and replaced without worrying about others. At the micro level, this can be as simple as ensuring that technologies are extendable. At the macro level, this involves considering option value and decisions. We know transportation consumes land in specific ways. Ground transport in long strips, sea and air transport in large, relatively compact ports. Preserving right-of-way, ensuring that capacity is available, is one way of preserving future options. The problem, of course, is spending present dollars for future possibilities which must be discounted. It is urgent to deal with strategic technology questions and opportunities. We have mature systems and further investment has low if not negative returns. The failure of transport to improve does not bode well for economic and social development. We should use planning to create situations in which there is wise inquiring about new enhanced futures. Technology improvements are not new and advances in ITS-like things post planning opportunities. The opportunities presented are close to the heart actions by traffic engineers to improve traffic flow. Planning ways of thinking might bring these out of niche applications to networks. For instance, the automated highway idea is consistent with a highway provider's dogma. Concentrate resources and achieve economies of scale. That is soft in general, and to make it understandable, the authors would be tempted to use examples of some things to be done. There is a trap here that we have faced in many discussions. The medium examples are taken as the message, what to do. Yet the message is not that the technology forms used as examples are the things to do. 
The message is to explore likely options and let the public choose. 